Welcome to the Christ and Classics podcast, where we consider the classics in light of the Christ. My name's Colton Moore, and I'm here with Devin Wilkins, and we've got a special guest today. His name is Dr. Uh, Mark Minaldo, and he's an associate professor and the head of the Department of Liberal Studies at Texas A&M University Commerce in Commerce, Texas, to which he came in 2017 after spending seven years at Texas A&M International University. He attended Colorado College as an undergraduate student, and it was here that Dr. Minaldo discovered the art of close reading and the power of interdisciplinary scholarship. He took these skills with him to Michigan okay. State University, where he earned his doctorate in political science. As a teacher, now, he encourages students to see the connection of ideas across disciplines and beyond the classroom. When he's not teaching, he can usually be found drinking coffee at the local coffee shop, reading a book, or talking to friends. Uh, he and his wife are the proud parents of three children, Oliver, Henry, and Ava, and they reside in Greenville, Texas. Dr. Ronaldo, can I call you Mark on this? I mean, Please do. Is that appropriate, Mark? <laughs> Mark, <laughs> thanks for joining us well, today. Mark or, 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 or Air Minaldo, if you want to go German on me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Mark, we, we wanted to have you on, on this podcast because you and I are just recent friends. We, we've, known, we've only known each other for um, a year and I guess three quarters, going on two years now. We went to church with each other for a short period of time where we briefly got to know one another. And over the last several months, I mean, most of our relationship has been consisted in phone calls and, and texting and various meetings here and there. But uh, I'm, I'm really excited to, to have you on and to um, share how, uh, well, just give us your experience with, with the great books and how they've uh, shaped you into the, into the man that you are, that you are today. So I suppose we are. Um, yeah. So first of all, thanks for that introduction. It was brilliant. I don't know who wrote it. Oh. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, don't don't copy and paste it uh, into Google because you might you might you might uh, find that introduction oh on some glad, college website. My, my, my web page. Um, did you write that? I suppose. Yeah, I did. It was my student friend. <laughs> my student friend. <laughs> I was supposed to write a student-friendly bio, so that's my student-friendly bio. <laughs> that was a, uh, it was a great bio. That's why I picked it. I think bio should be a little more impersonal, a more more personal. Colton, does Mark teach at your alma mater, your alma mater, or do you go somewhere else? Oh, good. Yeah. So, yeah, I got my undergraduate degree in music education at Texas A and M University in Commerce. Uh, and so, uh, Mark teaches, Mark teaches there as well. Yeah. Oh, but he wasn't your teacher. No, he, I don't think you came in 2017. No, I left, left in 2015. He left out. Oh, I suppose, <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose what I'll, I'll do is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll contextualize the, the, the answer, you know, by giving you a, a sort of, um, a description of my education. And the sort of the odd way I came to, you know, the greatest book of all, so to speak, right? My journey has been one in books, but uh, the Bible was not one of them for a very long time in my life, up until early 40s, mm -hmm. I would suspect. But um, like all numbskull high schoolers, I had no idea what I was going to do going to college. Um Well, not all, well, not all people mm -hmm. are numbskulls, but I definitely was part of the numbskull pack. Um, I was a sort of introverted kid. I read, I didn't like reading for class, I like reading on my own. Uh, I thought I was cool because I was reading Herman Hess rather than reading the, 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 the standard <laughs> English class books. And I suppose it, like every, uh, every kind of wayward youth, I was looking for some sort of, uh, cheap, cheap transcendence, um, through books like, Siddhartha mm. and um, uh, looking for meaning in places that you just weren't finding it. I didn't grow up in, in the church. I grew up with this sort of strange Latin American spirituality in my household and in mm. the, the, the culture around me. 
which could be a, a whole other podcast. But um, when I got to college, uh, I, I discovered, well, I didn't discover, it was imposed on me. I was like, I was put in a philosophy class against my wishes. And um, hmm. I, I had this sort of... This is at Colorado? Actually, this was my first institution was Fairfield University in Connecticut. It was my freshman year. I spent my freshman mm-hmm. year in Fairfield. It was a Jesuit school. And the only reasoning behind mm-hmm. that was my mm-hmm. mom says, the Jesuits, my mom's from Long Island. She's like, the Jesuits got money. So <laughs> she thought I'd get a scholarship. And I did. I did get a scholarship. And that was the sort of the, uh, you know, my mother, mother's calculation was where you live, grew up in Mexico, you're not going to get in-state tuition. We got to get you guys scholarships. So at Fairfield, I was confronted by a Jesuit. So a man in the collar. And I just like, what the heck's this guy doing in the classroom? And I'm, we're, we're reading these books, probably my first couple weeks in the, in the course, I'm just in a fog. I don't know about you guys, freshman year. It's like, what am I doing here? Yeah. I'm all, I was always tired. <laughs> um, nobody's yeah, doing, insecure. No one's doing my laundry. You know, the food stinks. And uh, <laughs> out of nowhere, right? So we go, go through the first weeks of class, reading actually a book by Thomas Nagel, Nagel, The Problems of Philosophy. And I'm like, what is this? This is boring. Not into it. Why am I in this philosophy <laughs> class? And then we get, we read our first uh, dialogue. You know, I, I didn't even know who Socrates was, to be honest. I read our first dialogue, which was the Euphithero. I don't know if you've uh, taught that, but mm-hmm. the Euphithero is a dialogue on, on so to speak, on mm-hmm. piety, where Socrates confronts, not confronts, he runs into Euphithero, who's, who is <laughs> Socrates on his way to his trial, and Euphithero is going to be, um, what is it? He's suing his uh, son? Or is it he's suing his father? I can't remember for killing the slave. And he's the basic gist of the argument. I talked to the gods and the gods told me to do this. And it's against nature, so to speak. It's against, he's going against his own blood. But the reason I was compelled to want to read it is because the, this dude reminds me of my dad, which is, you think, it's like not, it's not just my dad who thinks he speaks to the gods. <laughs> <laughs> and like it's still you know in this one-to-one relationship it's like oh yeah god told me to do this so this is what i'm gonna do and you're like oh man this guy's is, this guy's is wacky so in the, <laughs> in the first sense it it, it it was very very personal because the youth throw very much was an immediate relationship to my life like the the context where i grew up mm. but secondarily it was socrates interrogating you to throw and you know, it's hard to uh, recreate these memories, right? Because you're still a dopey 18 year old. But if I had to sort of in, in a nutshell, I would say, uh, hot dang, like who talks like this? That's what that would have, that was my, like, who is this guy? Who's this guy interrogating this? And why are these questions, why is like this unrelenting questioning, right? Boom, boom. It was like Mike Tyson in, in with words. And I never had mm-hmm. experienced anything like that in any conversation with any human being, right? Was the Euthyphro an assigned text? Yeah, it was assigned. So we'd read Euthyphro, then we read the Apology, the Apology, then we read the Republic, and then we kind of began gotcha. the ethics, I remember. But the, the point is, is that this, this something ha- I got I, I got stung, I was electrocuted, you name it. And I just try I just remember being this one fool in the class who was reading every page of the text. Mm. Right. And uh, I, I still have my freshman notebook. I write down the page number and I try to rewrite the dialogue so it wouldn't be lost. Mm-hmm. And um, all I know is that I, I, something happened and I didn't want to stop. That's, that was the, 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 the sort of career choice I made in that moment. It's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know, but I want to read these books. But the, <laughs> but, but the issue is that then I transferred from a very, you know, if you know anything about Jesuit schools, uh, they're not quite like St. John's, but their core curriculum is very strict, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to study religion. You're going to study philosophy. You're going to study music history. Mm-hmm. You're going to study art history. Like they still have a very, well, I don't know if it's changed, but they had a very strict core curriculum. I transferred to mm-hmm. Colorado College, which is in a whole other world in terms of uh, college curriculums. It's a one class at a time. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there is there was very little in terms of structured curriculum. It was very free. It was very open. Mm -hmm. And I majored in philosophy there. But the philosophy there is very interesting because at Colorado College in the late 50s or early 60s, I, can't, I don't remember the decade, a, a philosopher named John Glenn Gray worked there. And he was one of the first English translators of Heidegger. Mm. And before the world, uh, con uh, before America knew Heidegger, Colorado College was very Heideggerian. So when I, by the time I'm at Colorado College, that department is very what we call continental philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's all about continental philosophy. It's very Heideggerian and it's very postmodern. Mm -hmm. So my, my education in the classics in undergrad was almost nil. Right? I, I didn't read ancient authors. I read Heidegger. I read, well, I read the, you know, the moderns. I read Hume, Kant, uh, Paul Pierce, a uh, British philosopher, empiricism. But I probably read Heidegger in 60% of my courses. Mm -hmm. And, um, by the at the end of my education in undergrad and reading Heidegger and Lacan and Foucault and Derrida and all these sort of postmodernists who were all the they were still alive and all the rage, um, I finished feeling very, uh, uh, I felt an emotion of sort of incompleteness mm -hmm. and inarticulate at the same time. I was both inarticulate mm -hmm. and incomplete. And went to Michigan State, one, because I wanted to keep studying Heidegger, but two, because I felt, because I understood that the curriculum political philosophy that I was going to read was much um, broader. I was going to yeah. read ancient. Yeah. All I knew is I was going to read ancient authors. And and I got to, I got to Michigan State really not knowing what I was getting into. And I got these 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 strange ducks. These faculty members who they they would schedule their classes on Thursday night once a week, and we would sit down. We'd come in and we'd go from seven to midnight. Um, we're like, it's not like it's ten o'clock, man. The class is over. But all the senior guy, all the older students knew you just we just we're gonna meet about five to six hours wow. uh, each week, and we're just gonna read and we're just gonna read one book. So we would read one book a semester. I didn't know what I was getting into, yeah. but it turns out that I got that my faculty, they were of the so-called school of thought of uh, Leo Strauss, which was a German Jewish emigre who moved to the U S and made, uh, you know, was a somewhat opaque yet controversial character in the U S um, especially his students, mm. but their mode of teaching was very um, text driven uh, transliteration and and uh, uh, we don't contextualize the thinkers; mm. uh, they contextualize us, so to speak. Mm. They speak beyond their times. To um, so that was that's the basic gist. And so in grad school, I read Aristotle and Plato, um, but I also read Montesquieu. I read Franklin. I read uh, Rousseau. I read Heidegger. I did Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. um, and it was divided in, if you want it, in the most simplistic uh, mode between the ancients and the moderns. And Leo Strauss thought that there was a massive difference between ancient rationality and modern rationality. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the setup. That's the setup in terms of where I come from. Um, if I was uh, the great book education or the or the canon of Western political philosophy, it was from it goes from uh, pre-Socratics all the way to Heidegger. Yeah. It sounds like you were really curious and that kept you going, but was there a, a, a discomfort along the way? What, um, what led you to the point that you would become a believer? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's, so I'm done. I finished grad school about 29. Yeah. I think. And so I taught from age 30 so we'll put uh, we'll put uh, D Day as May first, twenty twenty two, because I wrote it down. That's when I I finally took part in the mm. Lord's Supper. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, so we so that's the timeline, May first, twenty twenty two. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> C three Commerce Community Church, a small little. Nice. I know. Oh, that's small, right. You were a there. Small little community. I remember because um, uh, one of the pastors. <laughs> yeah. One of the pastors uh, stood up and was just like in tears, just so thankful that you were you were 
partaking of the Lord's Supper for the first time. It was a, yeah, it was a fantastic moment. Mm. Yeah, so what happened? I mean, again, again, this is a sort of reconstruction of, of things, frag- of of a nonlinear process. I, for me, it was always nonlinear, which was... Um, it's hard to simplify. I, I would say as you age there's a couple of things you realize one i'm not a philosopher right like I, I in some sense i didn't see myself living the life of a philosopher and think of the 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 ideal of a philosopher is socrates right he's got a wife and kids but they're never around right he's got a job but he never does it um and I'm I'm far less complicated of an individual. I'm a real simple guy who likes ice cream and movies and my kids and, um, <laughs> but it, I, so I understood that like my life was not quite to be in pursuit of philosophy. But on the other hand, I think I understood philosophy enough mm. to feel to in a, in a fundamental way into it that it wasn't does not offer a consolation mm. in this life. Right. Or yeah, not, yeah. not, not, not even the afterlife in this life, like in, and in, in I, I, I liken it to like, um, I feel like Socrates was someone who, if he felt an emotion, he would immediately cauterize it by thinking about it. Right? Mm. So philosophy is like cauterize, it, it's cauterizing anything that would make you, um, anything that might cut you at the knees, you should be able to. Uh, deflect mm. and I'm just not that kind of human being and at the same time it, it, you from a from a thinker's perspective it kind of tends to nihilism I think mm. like it's it's easy I don't always see as uh, say ancient philosophy as only as a contemplation of the good you see you read enough of it and you understand they're very skeptical too yeah right they're be- their their intention with their skepticism their idealism and their skepticism. It's not like they were confused about uh, uh, idealism and they didn't understand that there was a nihilistic streak in human nature. They were just more, they were far more careful about veiling that than say Nietzsche and Machiavelli, Machiavelli were. So I mm-hmm. was, um, I would say that I had some very negative consequences from studying for philosophy for 20 years, which is that I would, to use our, the language of Christianity, it had hardened my heart to a, to a very significant degree. Hmm. But I could also intuit that I want, I don't know how to explain it. I wanted out. Does that make sense? But I didn't know how. Like you were living the allegory of the cave or something. Yeah. <laughs> Where it's like, I'm in the cave and I see the philosophers going out who maybe hmm. get the glimpse of the sun and I'm stuck in the cave. I'm like, well, where are they going? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you know what, Ronaldo, you don't get the car. We'll tell you about it when we come back down. But the, the, the yeah. sun's too bright for you. Uh, um, and I, I would, I, I would speak. You know, and and then if you're a human being with per, personal relationships, um, you, it's very hard to accept the indifference of the cosmos, right? Mm. So you have children, for example. You have children, mm-hmm. Colton. I don't know about you, Devin. I remember very yeah, yeah. clear yeah. experience when my son, my son was in the ER, and mm. uh, we didn't know what what was wrong with him. We just knew that he grew a series of what seemed unintended ish, uh, 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 a happy coincidence. He ended up getting a CAT scan when we just thought he had a throat problem, mm. and he had to have him. He had to have what what turned tend out to be a minor a minor operation, but if not attended to, it could, for children of that age, you can have really, you can have deadly consequences. Mm. And all I could remember is the rage I felt at not having any control over that situation. Mm. Right. Um, a sort of, sort of a, the, uh, I'll use a, the heady term, like cosmic indifference, mm. right. I can't do anything, nothing, you know, what, what is, what is a father to do in a situation where he has no control? Um, that's where you, I'd like my, st- what, whatever stoicism I might have just went out the window. Yeah. Right. Um, 
and so I knew that this is the thing that oriented me towards towards um, God wasn't anything philosophical. It was every it had to do with the relationship between my children, mm. and I felt that the the Socratic mode had nothing to offer, mm. right? Because the Socratic mode, in some sense, tells you your children. This is what Socrates tells you about children. He says it's a nature's lottery, right? Your kids are are it's like puppies in a pen. And it's very likely that your your kids aren't going to be philosophers. So Socrates dotes on Plato and his kids are nowhere to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't I didn't have that instinct instinct. I had the instincts in which my relation my strained relationship with my own father and my desire not to cultivate a strange relationship with my children overrode my need to see the the sun, right? To leave the cave and see the sun. And it wasn't until I read, I went through a summer read in Genesis. There's a great book if you're interested. It's called The Beginning of Wisdom by Leon Cass, the 800 page explication of Genesis. Oh. And it wasn't until a moment, a, a section I read on Noah about how his, it, his sons, in some sense, symbolized both the reverence and parasite, right? Ham symbolizes a denuding of his father. But I realize I'm both of those people. Hmm. I'm someone who lives in conflict with my own father. It's like, I'd never in my life read philosophy and come to a better understanding of my father until I read that explication of the relationship of Noah and his, his sons. And when the moment that happened, I felt like there was a movement in my soul, right? Like a, a turn. There's the notion of Socratic mm -hmm. turn. Yeah. That you turn towards the philosopher's soul turns outward for the first time. Then, then in this sense, it was like a restoring of a, a heart problem, right? I had a little heart surge. I didn't have the big one, but I had enough to like have some b blood pump. And the beginning of restoring a relationship with my father, even though it was just in myself, my dad didn't understand this. I couldn't have a conversation with him at this level. I just knew that something had changed. Something was different. Um, but that was still a very philosophical reflection of scripture. It wasn't a sort of, it wasn't the notion of a personal relationship with Jesus. And, you know, for me, Jesus was in a, in a different camp altogether. I didn't know how to approach him. I didn't know where to start. Um, I kind of, I, I kind of sealed him off. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll stick to the old Testament in some sense and I'll seal off the new Testament and let it, uh, this is in your mind. You've got a plan, right? I've got a plan for Jesus. He doesn't, <laughs> this is the philosopher's mode of thinking. I have a plan. I'm going to control it. And let me structure my understanding in a certain way. Yeah. And I had this, con I conceived, I'll just go through the Old Testament book by book and see what happens. Hmm. Well, I, that didn't quite work. That didn't quite work the, the way I expected it. What work, got you but, interested yeah. in reading Genesis? I'm kind of random in my reading. Like I'll just pick up a book <laughs> and decide that this is, this is the thing I'm going to start reading. I started reading second. I, I started reading Samuel one and two because I was interested in the sort of epic, the epic journey of, of David. Yeah. Uh, I, I had read, I had read some line somewhere that David is the closest thing to having Aristotelian friendship in all the old Testament. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So I started reading, I started reading that. And then I was also reading uh, Cormac McCarthy's road at the same time. And I think Colton, if you might recall, I said the road was the sort of, you know, uh, before Genesis, the road was the thing that just made this, I had created this heart and cauterized heart, this armor. And the road was something that just mm. pierced the armor, right? This mm. chink in the armor. And I remember getting to the end of the road and feeling this um, overwhelming sense of being in the place of Papa in the book, the main character who is loves his son, but has also been hardened by this sort of post apocalyptic world. And he is in that sense, veering towards nihilism mm -hmm. and his son's the only thing that can save him. I don't know if spoiler alert, <laughs> if you haven't read the road, that book has something very spiritual in it. That should be mm -hmm. immediately taught in classical schools to be on a senior year, teach the road, uh, um, yeah, but during COVID, at some point I said, you know, why am I reading Second Samuel? The book starts on page one, so to speak. Let me go back and start reading, you know, 
page by page. Hmm. And I, I suppose I got to number, I, I, I got into numbers by the time COVID happened and we went home and, and I started just feeling the, feeling the, feeling sort of tectonic shifts happening. So I stopped that numbers and, or I stopped that. I don't know. I remember where I stopped. I might've run the whole Pentateuch, but then I picked up Cass's Genesis and spent the rest of the summer just reading his book. <clears throat> Uh, and then the next summer, I read his book on Exodus. Hmm. Um, but, but in terms of like the classic shape in my Christianity, it was more like uh, it was more like the possibility of a nuclear meltdown than a sort of happy congruence. It was Chernobyl was about to happen because I had been so hardwired hmm. to put Revelation in a whole different world of understanding and philosophy and, and religions lived in separate spheres, right? It was revelation isn't philosophy. Philosophy is philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, very, very not, I had a not Catholic view of philosophy. The Catholics see a beautiful synthesis. Aquinas synthesizes Aristotle and the scriptures. But Leo Strauss was of a different mode of thought. His was, he had a Maimon, his, his worldview was centered on Maimonides which is revelation and philosophy live in a very uneasy tension with each other. Never shall the twain meet. There was a sort of firewall separation. I kind of wonder what would have happened if it ended up staying at the Jesuit school, you know? <laughs> yes. Cause so and it was very true. as a child, I was very primed towards God. Mm -hmm. I like not, in the ways my brothers weren't, I was always searching for God. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know. That's one of the great counterfactuals, yeah. right? Like yeah. what if he had stayed at the gym? <laughs> In God's kindness. Yeah. I know that you, you collaborated in a class with uh, Pastor David at uh, Commerce Community Church. So David. was this before or after COVID where you kind of co-taught a theology and oh, philosophy Way class? before. Four years way before, before okay, that. three or four years before that happened. Really? So, like, how did how did that uh, play into all this? Oh yeah, I just I found him I found him um, supremely interesting. I was curious, right? Because <laughs> look, the, the thing is, is like I wasn't some sort of atheist, you know. I I I, I, I but I did have a standard sort of slogans like, well, you can't demonstrably either prove or refute revelation. So that was my, that was a modality. And then when I met David, I, um, and I, he was going through Romans, I think, in his community group. And I was just his neighbor and I just walked in one day. I was like, this dude reads the Bible the way I read philosophy, line by line. Right? I had no expectations mm. I had no expectations. I had no prejudices. Mm. I'm like, all right, I'll just, and I just saw to, you know, at what level of, 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 of specificity he was taking the text into consideration. And when he would go fast for the, I guess, for the sake of the group, I'd get upset. I'm like, why are you going so fast? Slow down. Like you were doing. And so I, I found that very curious. I found that interesting. And so when we taught uh, our faith and reason class, I saw it even better, right? I saw a better sense of, how much close reading was involved uh, in his perspective as a Christian, but it never it, I, at that point it never it never got higher than the level of like ooh like that was you know it, it, how to describe it it's like watching an athlete perform <laughs> right and you're at the game and you're like ooh nice moves right like that was a great reading, um, but I didn't go home and tell Carrie. <laughs> let's go let's go you know let's go to church i just um i'll tell you that uh, I, I was i was i was it was hard for me to get under i i was very interested in jesus jesus i was like this guy this is a curious cat right this dude is there's something going on here i had a tough time hmm. with christians <laughs> because i didn't find them interesting right so i uh, and those were oh, yeah. my, these were my prejudices. I'm like, aren't you more <laughs> curious than like, why aren't you, why aren't you guys studious? Why aren't you, you know, uh, 
and yeah. you know these were mm-hmm. these were just mm-hmm. also egoistic problems as well but and so what i would i would presume is that jesus was more of a philosopher than meets the eye right i thought he was enigmatic esoteric i thought the the fact that he wrote uh, spoken parables reminded me of socratic irony and thus in my in my presumptions in my presumption his mm-hmm. teaching must be veiled the teacher must be veiled, and thus it must be at some level fundamentally philosophic. David d- totally disagreed with me. <laughs> He's like, no, it, it cannot remain veiled. I'm like, no, it has to remain veiled. You Americans want everything to make sense. The, I'm putting them in with the ancients, right? I, I threw Jesus in with the ancient understanding, ancient communication, um, a whole different order. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is the question is like, well, what if I'd stayed at Fairfield or have we moved on? Um, oh yeah. What, what did the class yield? The, the class yielded a relationship with David, a friendship. Right. And yeah. And David, and David is now your, yeah. David is now your pastor. Yeah. And now he has to he, put up with He me. baptized you, correct? Yes, he did. He, uh, he he yeah, said the incredible. funniest thing once. I said, "What?" Well, he said the funniest thing in that class. I, was, I said, "Man, if Socrates and Jesus would have met, what a conversation that would have been!" And David, without hesitation, goes, "Yeah, he would have become a Christian." <laughs> and I just laughed. Oh, I I laugh wow. because I'm like, <laughs> "What hubris, right?" You know, in my eyes, it's like, "No, they'd ha- it'd be like a, a good." It, you know, it would be like Bruce Lee versus someone else, right? It would be like two two giants of some sort. But he was so sure. And I was like, how are you so sure? And I, I loved hanging out with David. But for him, everything was always returned to like sovereignty of God. I'm like, man, give me a break. Just let human, like the human thing happen sometimes, right? So Socratic things are human things. We the the peaks of humanity are at some level human genius, and so we were. I was. I was. We, it wasn't. It was very. It was like a friendly joust between me and him for four years, um, but very polite. Never mm. at some level. We never degenerate into, you know. But uh, I can't imagine having to hang out with me for four years and being like, oh man, that guy. He just like if he just. <laughs> just if that would so, happen yeah so mark so you are you're teaching at this college um and sure. e- even co-teaching a class with a with a, the local pa- a local reformed baptist pastor there and uh describe for us what it was like for you um uh, to realize that Jesus' claims in the New Testament to his identity and his message in the world are true. What happened? What was? What did God do to to, to bring you around, if you will? Besides a lot of pain, <laughs> right? I think first pain, pain like pounding, like I got pounded, man got pounded in, in emotional pain um, um, because like I said the, that mm. armor was 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 that armor it turns out was not you know um, what is armor made up again it's a, that metal it turned out it was aluminum Wrong. foil it's like it's like you're done. you know you think that it's armor, <laughs> and it, it, he tells you no, it's aluminum foil, kid. Like you don't have anything here. It's it's so brittle, but but the the mindset yeah. is is so hard, yeah. and the heart is so hard, and that it, it takes a long time. But so what had to happen is the strangest thing had to happen because I had this Aristotelian when I was undergoing what let's call it conversion for lack of a better word it i didn't want it to happen i could i could sense something was happening and i didn't want and i didn't and at an intuitive level i didn't want it to happen that's for sure i wasn't along for this ride at all hmm. i was like hope you know when you're just 
holding on to like metal bars and you don't want to fall and you're slipping down the steps or something. I was like, I'm holding on to these bars no matter what. <laughs> and, and in my mind, it's like, as long as I keep, so there's a Islamic philosopher named Al-Farabi who brought, thanks to him, we, we the Greeks survived, right? The, the, the Muslims save us uh, because uh, uh, the Greek philosophy was going to be lost. And Al-Farabi had an Aristotelian view of God, of Allah, right? And which I think Muslims yeah. sort of still share, which is God is an ineffable substance out there, right? It's a, it's a sort of, a, upon reflection, you only can admit that he's a, it's not even a he, it's a perfection. And that perfection exists in perfect indifference to nature, mm. which is the reflection of his creation, right? So we exist by nature. And, and we're, think of us as, you know, our human nature is teleological, has a talos, it has an end. We can understand those ends, whether we fulfill those natures or not, is really not up to God, right? So again, firewall exists. I'm like, that's good. That's my God. Mm -hmm. Al-Farabi's God, Al-Farabi's Aristotelian God is my God. I can understand God as a perfection, but not as a person who cares about me. Um. And I remember telling, like, I had to psych myself up at one point saying, that's your God. Don't forget. <laughs> don't, don't lose sight of that's your God. <laughs> really? It's like, because I didn't understand what was that. And I started going to these, you know, I started, I started, I, I just went pure God. I went, I just dove into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over and over and over and over and over and over again. I can't tell you to what, it, uh, I can't remember how. And it just, I started, I, I emotionally, a, a sort of a hole opens up in my chest and we get to John, right? And I'm listening to this almost oh, yeah. like on a loop. If you don't, if your if your audience doesn't know David Sushet's uh, full reading of the Bible, now's the time to get into it because he's an, a British actor. And just like platonic dialogues, if you read the gospels dramatically, mm -hmm. It brings them to life, so to speak, right? And I just remember mm -hmm. getting to the part, uh, mm -hmm. what do we call this part in John, in the upper room uh, in, during the Passover, and then, right? And mm -hmm. then after the supper. The farewell discourse. I had, I would say it was the beauty of the, of the poetic and mournful Jesus who's trying to uplift his apostles who are, more abound by the fact that they don't know what's coming, but they know something is ending. Um, I just remember uh, basically breaking down and crying. Mm. Right. And, and, and I knew and wondering, am I mm. losing my mind? I, that was my first incident. Am I lost it? What's going on? It's a very rational reaction, right? It's like, you're listening to the, I, yeah. I, was, I read in Bonhoeffer, yeah. I'm reading yeah. the gospels. Like, I'm reading, I'm listening to um, uh, monastic chanting. I was like, this guy's like, anybody who knew me must have thought this guy needs a psychiatrist. And I just, I'm, I'm so, so I, so it's just pouring out <laughs> of emotion, but emotion because it's so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. Like what he says mm. is so beautiful yeah. that it, in retrospect, I'm realizing I'm finally touching reality, right? And it's not the way you thought you were going to touch the reality. You thought you were going to touch mm -hmm. the reality Socratically through dialectic. It's not that at all. It's through soothing. It's through comfort. And it's through it's from Jesus, what Jesus is saying, right? Now, he can, mm -hmm. he, can, he can give it to a Pharisee without a like that was my favorite that was my early favorite jesus like oh man this guy is killing it right i think he's funny he's comedic yeah. <laughs> i wish i knew aramaic so i could get the play on words and the puns but it's how he comforts the disciples i, I think that is the most um like the, mm -hmm. you know um i can't i uh, i should know i should know it by heart because it's a line that i think really just caught me but uh does he say he'll be with them till the end? In yeah, yeah, always to the end of the age. At the end of Matthew, right? So 
what 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 happens what i think is happening in jesus is the impossibility of man to think of both the particular and the universal right that's what the problem of plato is plato is not an mm-hmm. ideal form thinker he's a tension thinker right he's always in tension the forms are never full formal and complete it's actually satire in the republic the forms are always in the fact that they're incomplete because you're in the particular relationship between your particular self and trying to understand the eternal things. But Socrates proves that although he's the ideal, he's still stuck in particularity, right? Read the symposium. That is the explicit book where mm-hmm. you realize that the Republic is an extreme and the symposium is its moderating influence because you're still an erotic being tied to a particular particularity, right? I think Jesus is the, what yeah. what happens for us to sh- because we cannot understand the universal. Jesus is the particularity that gives us access to the universal, right? To the eternal, and we would never do it on ourselves. We cannot philosophize on our own, right? We only get to cosmic indifference. So, and he also comforts you by saying you don't need to philosophize. Um, Philosophy is good, but you don't need it. It's not an end in itself. Yeah. Um, no, it's like a, it's like a. So you put yourself out of a job. Oh <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I don't a, because I, it's... I, I, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I think if you read platonic dialogue the way they're supposed to be read, you can read the Bible in a in a way that it, I don't think it's read. And so here's my big critique. I don't see people read mm-hmm. the Bible with life or joy. I think they are uh, a little too accustomed to, I guess this is not the right word, but to like institutional reverence, right? Uh, the pastor said that this is how I should treat them. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I try to say, you know, you know, the scene of the, uh, the scene in which he asks, uh, when they ask, the te- they ask him for, um, should we pay the tax to Caesar? Right. I start imagining like the crowd around everybody around, right? Like these are tense situations. These are worldly situations, human situations. He's like, hey, let me see the let me see a Daenerys. Like, I'm just what a cool move. You know? Think of like think of the apostles, mm-hmm. the little puppies, like, oh, what is he gonna do now? And he I think of him I'm like, oh, he's looking at the Daenerys. You can't see this in the podcast, but he's like flipping it and looking at it and looking like cool hand Luke, right? And then he's, gives, and then you get the famous line, and then, <laughs> right, you give to Caesar, unto Caesar's God, was God. And then I imagine him taking the Nairs and flipping it back, and the Pharisee cashing it, and everyone going, <laughs> right? And everyone around him, like all the apostles, like, burn, you know? And I think that <laughs> right, I think that human element is missing when we talk about it, when we study it. Yeah. And you know, this is probably the same <clears throat> that you two gentlemen feel being steeped in the classics. It's like it's too American. Like I when I'm around mm-hmm. my brothers and sisters, they're like I, I feel like they've Americanized themselves or they don't understand how American they are or how modern they are or how un- and this is not a flaw because I'm not poetic but how unpoetically they read right and so the bible is the bible is poetry yeah, it's right. literature it's it should be also joyful i think even and so the it's not there's something too heady about the interpretations i think that forgo the particulars and that's the problem yeah. of reading plato without reading the particulars mark you are the uh you are the epitome of, of what i would have loved to have as an undergraduate professor and not only that i'm i'm, I'm really thankful to have gotten to know you i i wish i would have been in commerce for the last five, commerce texas for the past five or six years to get to know you and and like see the Lord work in you step by step as David and the other pastors have it's from from my outside perspective it's an incredible encouragement and um I'm delighted and very thankful to call you my friend 
Um, we are just about out of time, unfortunately. We didn't get to our other question about um, r- reading, but you kind of touched on this mm. like right there at the end. Um, so praise God, praise God for that, for oh. structuring it that way. Um, Devin, any last questions or thoughts? What was the question? Well, at least I know. Oh, the the, what was the, the last question? question? Yeah, that that last question was just uh, was just um, have has your approach to the ancient philosophers and ancient classics changed since you've become a Christian? And perhaps we could we could maybe ask that question on a different episode and like spend a whole time just talking about that and how we ought to read um, uh, the pagan classics and what ditches to avoid. Oh, I'd love to talk about, yeah, I'd love to talk about. That would be fantastic. Yeah. So, well, uh, Mark, I'm not sure if you've been listening to the podcast, but uh, we have a good buddy and his name is Micah and he's got a fantastic edition of Be Thou My Vision and he takes us away every single episode. Yeah, he does. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> All right. Let's hear it. Okay. <laughs>